The championship battle continues to brew in supercars after a solid weekend of racing in Tasmania. We saw some strategic battles towards the front, some clashes and controversy on track, as well as some technical gremlins creeping in with the Gen 3 machines. As always, I'm here to discuss that and much more as part of my round review, so let's get stuck into it. We'll kick things off as we always do around here with a quick recap of how each race unfolded. The first race of the weekend saw Will Brown convert pole position over Jack LeBrock, with Tasmania proving to be another happy hunting ground for that truck assist team. Race 1 also saw one of the more chaotic aspects of the weekend with a lot of carnage taking place down at the hairpin. It was sort of like a weird two group incident with Cameron Waters having some pretty hefty contact with the front left of Brody Kostecki and then almost in sympathy uh, Brock Feeney and Chas Moster also came together just a matter of seconds later. That led to some pretty significant steering damage for both Brody and Chas Mostert which took them both out of the race and having a bit of a hit on their championship charge. And then towards the back end of the race we saw Shane Van Gisbergen have a good little battle with Cameron Waters with Shane ultimately stealing that top, or not the top, but the third step on the podium. And that leads us to the results for race one, which was Will Brown taking the lead. Andre Heimgardner doing a very quiet but very solid performance up there in second. And as I flag Shane Van Gisbergen stealing that last step on the podium. Moving through to Sunday and race two of the weekend, which saw Brody Kostecki and Will Brown sort of team up and Brock Feeney a little bit at the start, but things went from bad to worse for Red Bull, with Shane Van Gisbergen having some hefty contact with Davey Reynolds and ultimately firing out to the outside wall, doing a fair bit of damage to his Red Bull machine. That took him out of contention for race two. He was back in race three, but some pretty big damage on that car. Meanwhile, at the front, we had a clean race between the two Erebus boys for the lead, but while they were focused on each other, Red Bull was stewing up a good strategy, and that ultimately saw Brock Feeney pit both of them for the win with a really clever overcut strategy. The podium of race two was Brock Feeney taking that win with the two Erebus boys in second and third. Then the third and final race of the weekend saw Erebus lock out the front row, but I was really excited about this one because Cameron Waters was towards the pointy end. He'd been showing great car pace all weekend, but was just never in a position to capitalize. And unfortunately that all came undone pretty quickly as he had a terrible start, which pretty much ruined his race from the worst to go. Further back in the pack, we saw some big contact on the run into turn two. I think it was James Golding just pinballing between some of the cars back there, doing some damage. And then later on in the race, we saw more contact with Andre Heimgardner bo botching an overtake on James Courtney into turn two as well, leading to those guys to go in the gravel. And then later on, we actually saw that move executed to perfection from Brock Feeney, who put a great move on Jack LeBrock. And then finally, we had another late race battle between Brody Kostecki and Shane Van Gisbergen, once again for the third step on the podium. But that was a really good back and forth battle that I very much enjoyed. So that final podium, it was more of the same in terms of the names, just in a slightly different order, with Will Brown getting the win, Brock Feeney in second, and Brody Kostecki stacky in third. So through all that, how did I go with my predictions ahead of this weekend? In short, not good. A bit like Perth, it was a bit of a bad performance on the prediction front. My first prediction was that we would see a shock pole position. That did not happen. Erebus and Red Bull were very much at the pointy end all weekend long. Although Truck Assist did a very good performance in qualifying right towards the pointy end of things. So they were my shining light, but unfortunately not enough for me to get the tick on that prediction. I also predicted a win for James Courtney after he started to get a bit of momentum in Perth, but all that was pretty much undone this weekend. It was a bit of a terrible weekend for those guys actually in the uh, Snowy River Caravans car. And then finally, I also predicted a high profile teammate collision, not something I wanted to happen, but just with how competitive both the Erebus boys and the Red Bull boys have been in recent past, I thought that would come to blows this weekend. The Erebus guys, who were probably the highest risk this weekend, played things nice and cleanly. But it wasn't all clean, and that brings us to the carnage report. So this is where I break down some of the more notable incidents from the weekend, starting off with practice where Andre Heimgartner and Declan Fraser had some awkward front-to-rear contact down into turn two. Felt like these boys were getting too racy way too early on in the weekend, but neither of them seemed overly fussed about the incident. What was a much bigger talking point, though, was a 
huge near miss between James Courtney and I believe Davey Reynolds down into turn six. Courtney was on a hot lap. The rest of the field was sort of warming up their tires, swerving back and forth, and they very nearly had major contact at huge uh, speed differentials. So great job by James Courtney to avoid a major incident and damage to his car. In qualifying, we saw light contact between Cameron Waters and both of the Dick Johnson racing cars as he caught up to those guys on his quickest lap. This one was nothing too egregious in my opinion. It was just a case of lots of cars on a small track. These things kind of happen. But but there was a bit of tension between drivers in both camps after that one. And then in the races, as I highlighted earlier, lots of small to medium incidents, that chaos staying at the hairpin between, you know, four plush drivers. Reynolds and SVG having the biggest contact of the weekend. Courtney and Heimgartner having that clumsy incident at turn two, which we're going to explore in more detail soon. And the other one I just had to shout out was James Courtney doing some autocorrect at 200 k's an hour when he sort of half spun one of the BJR cars, but then put them back in the right direction direction in one smooth motion. It was a very entertaining piece of driving and the boys carried on as if nothing happened. That brings us to Clash Chat, the segment of the show where I pick one incident from the weekend to discuss it in a bit more detail, sharing my personal opinion and asking for yours as well. Now, there's a few incidents I could have picked from this weekend. Uh, the hairpin was the obvious one and I did get you guys to vote your thoughts on that, but I think it was pretty clear. It was just a bit of an unfortunate racing incident for all involved. So the one I want to delve into is that botched overtake from Andre Heimgardner on James Courtney, because I was surprised this one didn't result in a penalty for uh, Andre Heimgardner. He was the aggressor. He was the one initiating the overtake. The boys went side by side through turn seven, then into turn one, and ultimately turn two, where Andre locked up and took them both off the road, in my opinion. Now, I was surprised Andre didn't get a penalty for this, because... The commentator said both the boys went tip for tap, they gave as good as they got, but from what I could see, it seemed like James Courtney was aggressive, but always had control of his car, whereas Andre Heimgartner just looked completely out of control locking up into turn two. So this one was declared a racing incident, but in my mind, I thought Andre should have got a penalty for this. So just my personal opinion, I'd love to know what you guys think of this particular incident because it did raise my eyebrows. Would love your thoughts down in the comments below. All right, let's talk about the key positive takeaways from the weekend, at least for me. Now, the first positive point I wanna mention here is that that title battle continues to shape up nicely. That battle between Erebus and Red Bull just continues to look like it's gonna be the story all season long. Obviously, we'd love to see more teams involved in that fight at the front, and hopefully that will happen. But for now, at least we've got two uh, rivals going head to head with pretty much both of their drivers in both camps. So that's really promising. The other thing that was a big positive was the underdog team starting to show some potential and promise in Gen 3 with Andre Heimgardner having a good result for BJR on the Saturday and Truck Assist having really good quality sessions, unfortunately not having the best races and holding on to those strong positions, but certainly up there, which was good to see. The other positive, I think, was that all three races felt a little bit different. We sort of had familiar names towards the front, but each race panned out slightly differently and had a different storyline going on, so that made it interesting for me. And then finally, a bit of an odd shout out here, but I also want to compliment the new podium that supercars are doing. Uh, they introduced it in Perth, they've done it again here in Tasmania, which has the uh, podium on top of the pit building, allows the fans to get nice and close. And I think this is a really good solution for these smaller rounds where the crowds aren't as massive, but by having everyone in a bit of a smaller space, a bit closer to that podium action, I think it looks really, really good on TV. Moving into the things that I didn't like so much seeing this weekend, starting off with a bit more Gen 3 fragility, we're seeing some odd mechanical issues sneaking into the Gen 3 cars. We saw uh, a weird potential ECU issue for Brock Feeney during qualifying on the Saturday, I believe it was. Uh, a weird engine issue for Tim Slade in the final race. Just lots of oddities creeping in as the cars just get punished race after race. So I'm sure all those issues will be sorted, but it's obviously a shame to see some of those teams impacted by those problems. And we did see reasonably conservative racing across the weekend. It wasn't, it wasn't dull in my opinion, but uh, yeah, it certainly wasn't quite hot and heavy as we're used to seeing around Tasmania. I think everyone being quite protective of their new cars, and I think that showed in the action. And then finally, we're still waiting to see that GM versus Ford battle at the front. I really wanna see this happen. I think this is key for Gen 3. 
um, to get that rivalry growing, to get that uh, passion between the fan bases ignited again. Uh, we're seeing good racing at the front between the drivers, but again, it just goes to the next level when we see the two brands going for the ultimate prize. So what was my overall weekend rating for supercars in terms of entertainment? I'm going to give this one a four stars. That might be a little bit generous. In reality, it's probably a 3.5 from me, but I don't let you guys vote with half stars, so I feel like I should play by the same rules. And four stars is where the majority of you guys fell as well. We had 53 people vote on this one with the vast majority, or 55% to be fair, voting four stars, with the next group, uh, or the next highest group voting three stars. So, it is probably between the two for most of the group by the time you average it out. But yeah, I feel like this weekend, you know, the race is simmered, but they never really bowled over into top shelf excitement. So, you know, solid, plenty of storylines to keep us entertained. But yeah, still waiting for that real spark from Gen 3, uh, which we saw hints of in Melbourne, but obviously cut short by the uh, time certainty. So I want to see more like Melbourne, but just over a full race distance. So fingers crossed we do get that soon. As always, I like to include some questions and thoughts from you guys as well. The first one here coming from Zai saying, as a Victorian, I like seeing the Vic teams doing well, but it is nice to see small teams like MSR up at the top. I think this is a really good shout out. MSR have like this odd affiliation with Simmons Plains. They did really well there last year as well in quali at least. And once again, with a completely new set of regs, they're right there towards the front as well. So it's really good to see. I just hope MSR can sort of find what's working for them this weekend and hopefully carry that to other events throughout the season and that we slowly sort to see them become more of a regular towards the front end because I find those guys entertaining to watch. I think the cars look spectacular. So fingers crossed we see those guys at the pointy end more often. The second question here from Curry Pie asks, is there a reason why the Mustangs are lacking in pace compared to the Camaros? Or is it just a case that the Mustang teams haven't found the pace yet and need more time? Now, this one's a dangerous one for me to bring up because it does involve that parity debate, which everyone gets very emotional about. But the thing I want to focus on here is that Cameron Waters is kind of thrown a spanner in the works this weekend because he's a bit of an outlier there at the front showing some real real pace now he had some pace in qualifying that showed as if he was going to take pole position in both of those races on Sunday obviously encountered the DJR cars though and then you know at different points of the race as well he showed more pace than the leaders as well so you got to wonder if he was more towards the front if he would have been able to challenge for wins and this gets tricky because when there is this parody debate brewing in the background you've got to ask the question you know is Cameron Waters actually showing the potential of that Mustang and the other guys just aren't hooking it up to its full capability or is Cameron Waters just that in tune and that talented that he's outperforming the equipment he has beneath him and the other guys aren't able to do it so I want to bring this up it's just an open-ended question I thought it was a really interesting discussion point then finally Chris Croft said that the racing wasn't that great at all the Gen 3 car is very weak the Chaz spin should not have taken him out of the race and the SVG hit should not have required such extensive repairs so two parts to this question the first part on the quality of the racing yeah, it's an interesting one. I, as I said, it was certainly tamer than I was hoping for, but I didn't think it was bad necessarily. I think it really depends on where your expectations were coming into the weekend. And I must admit, my expectations were higher as well, because normally we do see a bit more excitement around Tasmania than we did see uh, this year in 2023. So depending where your expectations were set, I can certainly see why some might have been disappointed with that. And I do actually have a dedicated mini sort of Gen 3 review in progress video coming in the next few weeks, taking a look at the racing over the first third of the season. And in that video, I'm going to delve into some of my theories as to why the racing has been on the tamer side. Then for the second part of the question about the Gen 3 car being a bit on the weak side, I would definitely agree with this, especially when it comes to the steering racks, which are taking a lot of damage this year. And these cars were hyped up as being able to take more of a hit and that steering damage wouldn't be as much of a problem. But from what we've seen so far, it seems like they're more fragile than ever in that department. Uh, I agree that while, you know, Chaz did hit that grass bank at a pretty awkward angle, I was also surprised to see that his steering was, you know, damaged in a bad way. And obviously SVG's hit into the wall and just the collision with Davey was pretty solid as well. 
Uh, but I was also surprised to see that they had to bring welders out to fix that car. So fingers crossed they can keep chipping away at it because I think it is once again one of those reasons why we are seeing drivers be a little bit conservative in those wheel to wheel battles. But a big thank you to everyone that submitted a question or a comment. Honestly, it's my favorite part of these videos. So thank you, keep it coming. And if you do want to get your own thoughts and questions featured, be sure to subscribe and keep an eye out for my community posts where I ask for your opinion on things. Looking at the championship standings though, leaving uh, Tasmania, Brody Kostecki still leads the way despite that horrible race one, but Will Brown has closed up in second place. Chas Moster in third, also having a bad weekend on the Saturday especially, but still up there. Shane Van Gisbergen, an up and down weekend for him in fourth. Brock Feeney sort of creeping up there in the points order in fifth. Cam Orders in sixth, Home Gardner seventh, Davey Reynolds eighth. Will Davidson doing surprisingly well in the top 10 despite that poor car pace in 9th and Jack LeBrock in 10th. On the team's championship, Erebus are still leading the way. A really strong weekend for them once again. Red Bull in 2nd and Tickford actually down there in 3rd now. A quick wrap of the support categories. I had a super busy weekend including a fun run on Sunday so I didn't get to watch as much of the supports as I hoped to but I thought I'd highlight a few things from what I did see. The Aussie racing cars put on some great slipstream in battles as we expected. The Porsche race saw Greg Murphy get his first win in that championship, and I believe his first win on our Australian soul as well. So we've got that Murphy name, that next in line coming up through the ranks. Formula Ford saw a big incident, multiple big incidents actually on the Sunday. So crazy little race from the Formula Fords. And the Tassie Tin Tops, just some great variety and some really interesting cars in that field that I did enjoy seeing uh, when I did get a chance to tune in briefly. So overall, a solid weekend. Like I said at the top of the show, we had some highs, we had some lows, but I was entertained pretty much the whole way through in Tasmania. So I did enjoy it. The next event is up in Darwin though. Time to thaw out after a freezing weekend in Tassie. That event's going to be on June 16 to 18. I'm really looking forward to this one. I do love this event. I'd love to get up there one day as well. But I'll be doing a round preview and review for that as I will for every round this season. And between now and then I'm going to help bridge the gap and hopefully supplement that lack of supercars racing with some more discussion videos. As I said, I want to do that sort of Gen 3 review and progress video looking at the pros and cons of the new cars so far and I also want to delve into these rumors of a new street circuit potentially happening in Canberra soon for supercars so keep an eye out for those ones do subscribe and turn on notifications as I said earlier if you do want to guarantee you see my videos but until then thank you for your support thank you as well for getting involved in the voting and the discussions hope to see a lot more of that moving forward and I will see you in the next video very very soon